A very busy one today. I'm Johnny Mack with your daily comedy news. House Republicans voted to remove GOP conference chair Liz Cheney from her leadership position. Seth Meyer said, but they're already claiming it never happened. Kimmel, you know, you can't have Republicans going around saying Biden won the election. People might get the right idea. Fallon, yeah, Republicans haven't turned on someone this fast since they tried to murder Mike Pence. Kimmel, I'm confused. I thought these guys hated cancel culture. Colbert, they had to. She was a loose cannon. They made her turn in her badge and her gun and her other gun and her other other gun. They really like guns. Fallon, after the vote, Liz Cheney said she doesn't want Trump to get near the Oval Office ever again. Yeah, it's not that hard. All you have to do is hang a sign outside that says, just salad. Trevor, I mean, here they are, trying to move past the attempted coup and focus on looking forward to the next attempted coup, but Cheney just wouldn't let it go. Trevor, wow, I respect Liz Cheney taking a stand against Trump, but it does feel a little less threatening when she's doing it as she's being removed from power, you know? It's got the vibe of a villain falling into a volcano while saying, this isn't over! Stephen Colbert, her principal political patron, is a man who was compared to Darth Vader and took it as a compliment. She learned Washington infighting from a man who lived a year with no heartbeat. If I were Kevin McCarthy, I'd grow a beard and dig a spider hole. Stephen Colbert, Cheney was ousted via voice vote during a closed door meeting, so we don't know exactly what happened. But sources in the room said she made a defiant final speech that drew booze from her colleagues. But to be fair, Matt Gates boos any woman not wearing braces. So good. Great jokes there, guys. Hey, John Mulaney walked onto the stage in the city winery this week. This from Vulture. He was wearing a long-sleeved striped polo shirt and jeans. A notable departure from the suit viewers have grown accustomed to seeing him in. He was heavier. He looked healthier. Throughout his hour-long set this week, his appearance served as a reminder that he, like all of us, is coming out of the pandemic different than when he went in. You know the recap, he went to rehab, now he's getting divorced. When he was on stage, he read aloud from a GQ interview he says he has no recollection of participating in. Wow. And he recapped how after an initial stint in rehab in September, he relapsed after hosting SNL in late October. Then began an unexpected stint as writer-performer on Late Night with Seth. He did that to try to impose some structure on his life. Really interesting. In December, his friends staged an intervention that led to a second publicized rehab stint, which lasted through late February. He told the audience he was over 140 days sober, at which point the audience clapped. This review says, Mulaney's show wasn't a show. Candid, loose, sometimes hard to watch, sometimes so funny it made the audience convulse in laughter. It was a writing session. He was doing all new material, not attempting to work in any of the jokes he was building in outdoor shows before rehab. It was raw, both in its frankness and in the complete lack of polish that we typically associate with Mulaney's work. It was fascinating to see him to try to figure out how to apply his stylistic signatures to more intensely personal subject matters. A lot of Mulaney's classic jokes hinge on taking things not very seriously. But it's a challenge when the subject matter is, in fact, quite serious. How social anxiety has contributed to his drug use is not something one can easily be flippant about. Pettiness, which has always been in his act in small doses, came to the forefront. He spent a large portion of the set complaining about his intervention, organized by his college friends and his celebrity friends. How dare they trick him into thinking he was getting dinner? Why in a room of the 12 funniest people he knows was no one being funny? That sounds like a good bit. Vulture reminds us of a joke from 2012's New in Town album where Mulaney said, I don't drink. I used to drink and then I drank too much and I had to stop. That surprises a lot of audiences because I don't look like someone who used to do anything. That gets a laugh. On Monday, he surprised audiences by revealing that not only did he used to be reliant on drugs to get through each day, but part of him still desperately wants to continue to use. He uncomfortably laughed to himself a lot after jokes didn't get the exact reaction he expected as if to say... This isn't what it usually feels like for me to do comedy. With most of the material, Mulaney didn't come off particularly well. He knew it and leaned into it. The most exhilarating moments when we would make fun of the tone of the overwhelming support he got when the news of his drug addiction first came out. He would reveal something crappy he did to his friends and quickly remind the audience, it's a disease. Some audience members didn't know what to make of it. One person towards the end said they wanted to hear more about what college was like, as if to say, remember how much fun you used to be, John? 
That was not the worst thing someone shouted out. Some felt the need to woo when Mulaney listed prescription drugs he abused. When he said his relationship with audiences is the longest lasting, most intimate of his life, many began to clap. He cringed and asked them to stop. He hadn't meant it as a good thing. This sounds like an amazing show, and this is a great, great recap, Vulture. Great job. The tension underscored the inherent conflict of what the comedian and audience wants out of a night like that and the difficulty of an established comedian trying out a new identity in public, hoping audiences will meet where you are. Wow. Us Magazine had their own recap. Uh, They quoted somebody who tweeted after the show, so John Mulaney at City Winery was dot, 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 intense. 90 minutes that was mostly processing his intervention and rehab experience. Remarkably raw, vulnerable, personal. They quoted John saying, when I'm alone, I realize I'm with the person who tried to kill me. The tweeter described it as hilarious, harrowing, brave, and historic. Another person tweeted, just left John Mulaney's first post-rehab show at City Winery. I don't know much about comedy, but in my humble opinion, he did a great job. An excellent mix of humor and honesty. I'm rooting for you, dude. Sounds like it was just an amazing show. Switching gears from TMZ, Tony Hinchcliffe, famous for writing Comedy Central Roast series and working on Joe Rogan's podcast, did a set last week in Austin where fellow comic Peng Deng, who is of Chinese descent, that'll matter in a second, introduced him at Big Laugh Comedy. Dang said, give it up for the one and only Tony Hinchcliffe. But as soon as Tony grabbed the mic, he went right into calling Dang a filthy little effing uh, C word is starred out in the article I'm reading. I'm guessing that was a racial slur for someone of Asian ancestry. The racism wasn't lost on Dang. He posted the clip and wrote last week in Austin. I got to bring up Tony Hinchcliffe. This is what he said. Happy Asian Heritage Month. TMZ says now one could argue Hinchcliffe is famously known as an insult comic. And that this is right up his alley and he didn't mean anything by it. But TMZ says, even if true, times have changed. So these types of jokes aren't going to fly anymore, especially right now when violence against Asians is spiking nationwide. Frankly, these jokes are cheap and mean. Yes, be better than that, comedians. From Deadline, Robert De Niro has signed on to star opposite stand-up comic Sebastian Maniscalco in About My Father. This is a comedy loosely based on Maniscalco's life and his relationship with his father. In the film, when Sebastian tells his old-school Italian immigrant father, Salvo, uh, played by Robert De Niro, that he's going to propose to his all-American girlfriend, Salvo insists on crashing a weekend with her Tony parents. Though cultures clash, and it seems like the two families have nothing in common, by the end of the weekend, they're La Familia. The movie reunites De Niro and Maniscalco after the first two appear together in what? The Irishman. That's right. Sebastian Maniscalco is in Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. The president of Lionsgate says the way Sebastian talks about his father, Salvo, sounds to us like the type of guy who thinks that Robert De Niro should play him in a movie. Actually, Robert De Niro is incredibly selective about the projects he chooses. Time out. Check Robert De Niro's IMDb the last 20 years. No, he's not. So we are thrilled that he responded so strongly to this hilarious and heartfelt screenplay. He'll make a fantastic and funny pairing with Sebastian, blah, 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 blah. Hey, Ellen is quitting her show. It'll end her daytime show, that is. She says she's not stopping the show due to personal criticism and claims of a toxic workplace. She went on the Today Show and said, I really didn't understand it. I still don't understand it. It was too orchestrated. It was too coordinated. I learned that things happen here that never should have happened. I take that very seriously, and I want to say that I am sorry to the people who were affected. I have been catching up on my podcast. I was driving around yesterday, and I listened to CNN's late-night podcast, Behind the Desk. I like it a lot, although it is jumping out at me that... They didn't really get anybody to talk to them. Uh, you know, occasionally I think Camel appears, but like there's no Letterman or Conan or Colbert or Trevor. It's, it's kind of weird, at least not in the episodes I've heard yet. And not really that many comedians either. I listened to an episode about how it could really make your career. And I think the biggest name they got was Brian Regan, unless Elaine Boozler is a bigger name to you. It, it was just kind of. It just felt like they had an idea for a podcast but couldn't get the guests. It's a nice enough podcast. Behind the desk, that one is called. Uh, I went for a run this morning, humble brag. And what I really love doing on a run is when I can get lost in something. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'll run to mashups or I like running to long podcasts. So they gave me a three hour podcast of Joe Rogan and Dave Chappelle. No, I didn't run for three hours, but I do listen at 2.3 speed. So I got through. Almost all of it. Yeah, I ran for like an hour. I could do it. My knee's not hurting. Humble brag. I I highly recommend it to you. It's two guys 
They have chosen happiness over money. Yeah, they both have money. But they talk about the grind. Like, money doesn't just happen. You have to do the work. Speaking of the grind, I was looking at the numbers for the podcast. This podcast is having a big week this week, and I appreciate you all listening. Uh, May 2021 is going to be about two and a half times what the podcast was doing a year ago. So that's the grind. I knew when I started this, it would take time for an audience to find the show, and that is starting to happen now. So thank you. Anyway, Rogan and Chappelle... You know, they talk about the choices they made and how they pick happiness over money. And when you pick something you like to do, the money finds you. I know easier said than done, but I think that's always good advice. A lot of inside comedy there if you want to check that out. There's a couple parts where they start talking about MMA and boxing. When they hit one of those, hit skip for like three minutes and then they get back into the comedy stuff. But I highly recommend Joe Rogan with Dave Chappelle. I checked out Dave Chappelle's podcast. Uh, I didn't like it. I want to, but I don't the show is described as a salon style show Chappelle said the midnight miracle that's the name of it gives you a look into how me and my friends process the world around us and i think it will change the way listeners think of what a podcast can be wasn't feeling it i also checked out ricky gervais's new podcast that's the one you got to pay for with sam harris they put one episode out for free and i think pretty sure the one episode is an episode that already appeared on sam harris's feed but it's ricky on the phone Calling in a Sam Harris. I, I guess that's the bit, but Ricky, man, if you want us to give you whatever it is, 11 bucks, 14 bucks, I forget. I mean, you got it. This just feels like you had some stuff and you were like, yeah, hey, let's just put it out and see if we can make some bucks. Like, it doesn't feel premium at all, Ricky. Like, I uh, love you, but got to pass on that one. But here's a podcast you should check out. It is called the Follow Friday Podcast. It's pretty cool. It's got a good gimmick. So there's a guest. And then host Eric Johnson asked the guests who they follow and why, right? So you're going to have somebody on. You'll be like, hey, who do you follow on social media? Tell us about it. Good premise. So I was checking out the newest episode. Michael Tucker is the guest, and he talks about his YouTube channel, Lessons from the Screenplay, which was off my radar, but now it's on my radar. See, see, this is how this works. And I'm like, oh, cool. Deep dive on movie stuff. I like it. I'll read you the description. It says, on the episode, Michael explains why he likes having his assumptions challenged by the podcast Revisionist History. So then he gets into how one of the people he follows is Malcolm Gladwell. See how that works? Then Michael Tucker suggested that you follow Todd Vaziri to learn about visual effects in movies. And I thought this was a good point. Todd talking about how in some scenes you think something is CGI and it's not. And sometimes you think it's not. And it actually is. Eric brings up a good point. It's like makeup that, you know, bad makeup you notice, good makeup you don't notice. So it's a really cool gimmick of, hey, here's somebody interesting to talk to and let's find who they're also into. I remember back a million years ago when Sammy Hagar was singing for Van Halen and I love the Van Halens. I remember Sammy was talking about how he was driving around listening to the new Colts album. And I bought the new album by the Colts at that time just because I, could, I think that album's called Electric. And I was like, hey, good recommendation, Sammy Hagar. So let's take that and apply it to podcasts and social media. So it's the Follow Friday podcast. Eric Johnson talks to guests about who they follow and why. You'll learn a bunch about the guests. You'll discover some cool people. You can find Follow Friday wherever you listen to podcasts and at followfridaypodcast.com. And you know what day of the week today is? It's Friday. So Follow Friday, man. And thanks to Follow Friday Podcast for supporting today's daily comedy news. You're running out of time to vote. This week's comedy's top dog, it is Trevor Noah versus uh, Conan O'Brien. Lane Sperka said Conan was a great replacement for Letterman. Yeah, so he gets my vote. I kind of wish I had it to all do over again. I, I guess it was just my age, right? Conan took over late night in the 90s, and that's when I was dating chicks and stuff. So I wasn't really watching late night. But in retrospect, I think I would have loved late night with Conan O'Brien had I watched it every night. Oh, well, next time around, Conan with the lead here. If you want to stick up for Trevor, you are running out of time, my friend. Instagram at Daily Comedy News. Find the picture of Trevor and Conan. Vote in the comments. From IndieWire, Conan's tenure at TBS might be coming to an end, but he's getting ready for the HBO Max series. It's unclear what the show will be like. IndieWire points out that O'Brien is the latest in a recent string of comedians who have or plan on hosting a comedy show on a streaming service which is a relatively new phenomenon for the medium. For streaming services, there's never been greater competition for eyeballs and subscriber dollars than now. 
That said, despite the proliferation of streaming exclusive shows over the last few years, late night and otherwise topical comedy has been an undermined genre in the industry's leading streaming services. I think one of these streaming services should have a middle aged man reading comedy headlines. Right? That seems like a no brainer. IndieWire put together a list of six of Conan O'Brien's best late night comedy bits, saying Conan and his team have been responsible for countless hilarious comedy routines, blah, blah, blah. Let's hit the list, guys. Old time baseball from 2004. Conan heads to a New York park to play old timey baseball. 